Uh, you're, you're not even going to believe how wonderful Bakash is. Uh, we have, this is a real, real treat. And he is uh, um, a, a superstar in the, in the AI world, which we're not going to get into. He wants me to tell you that he is the head of MIT's probabilistic computing uh, lab. And, um, and um, what he's going to talk about us what he's going to talk about is the, um, all right, I got it. All right, he's going to let him do it himself. I'm, I'm, I'm just so, uh, I'm, uh, he's just so impressive. It's uh, difficult to even know what to say about him. So, um, no, I mean, no, I, okay. We can't say this about every computer scientist, but this one is super, super special. And, uh, and I hope he'll be, uh, with us every year, so please. Okay, that, th thank you. Um, so, uh, so I'm new to this group, um, but when I was chatting w w with Deb at the, at the welcome reception, um, I decided I would change my talk a little bit um, on the basis of that conversation. I hope it's, it's maybe more helpful for you as a result. Um, m my goal is really, um, going to be to help us uh, first maybe um, debunk some of the hype around artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm going to start just by trying to highlight, I hope intuitively, some of the gaps between our own capacity to think and uh, the um, significant uh, but still limited progress that AI has made. And then against that backdrop, I want to talk a little bit about some new uh, technology around AI that I don't think is likely to be familiar to this group that I think highlights both some of the risks of artificial intelligence uh, around health privacy, as well as some interesting uh, opportunities uh, that I'm hoping to get feedback from you on it all uh, about at the end. So uh, let's get started. Um, so the, the field of AI has historically um, measured its progress by its ability to build systems that can beat top, play, top performing people at their own game. So I remember uh, uh, Deep Blue's victory over Garry Kasparov uh, when I was a high school student. Um, more recently, uh, you know, we saw Watson beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy, and uh, AlphaGo, um, built by Google DeepMind, uh, actually, which actually very recently built, uh, defeated the actual world champion uh, at Go. And I think these are uh, legitimately um, treated as landmarks in the advance uh, of artificial intelligence. However, I think it's also really important to recognize how these successes speak to the limitations of AI technology. Consider that um, uh, pretty much any high school kid can learn how to play chess, Go, and Jeopardy. But it would be an enormous crash research project that would probably fail <laughs> to try to get Watson to extract the rules of chess from a manual, right? And AlphaGo can't parse English. So there's a lot of exuberance about AI, and I think especially in the health field, it's useful to, um, uh, to focus a little bit on Watson. So how many of you guys have been in some role that you're in um, bombarded uh, <laughs> uh, with sort of the success or the relevance of AI for transforming health. Okay, so a reasonable fraction. Uh, how many of you found yourselves pretty skeptical? Good, many of you who weren't bombarded raised your hand. Um, good, okay, good. Uh, so, you know, this trope that AI systems are smarter than anything else on the planet is an old one, and it's actually an old one even in IBM's marketing. Um, so, for example, this uh, is an ad from the 60s uh, for one of IBM's first computers. Um, uh, and it says, 
you know, the IBM 650 magnetic drum data processing machine built has been built for commercial use. Um, uh, you know, and it's a giant brain that's going to obsolete thought work, you know, knowledge work by some fraction of people. And, um, you know, in, in, in some areas of the press, I think this exuberance can get um, uh, just a little exaggerated, right? So it's like the real promise of big data is it's going to change the whole way that humans solve problems. Um, there's also a lot of fear around AI. Um, so I remember going to uh, a dinner in New York um, and I, you know, I mentioned that I work in AI uh, at MIT and the first question one of the guests asked me was, so Vikash, how scared should I be? <laughs> um, and at first I was kind of taken aback, like, you know, I didn't understand. And then I started just sort of looking at what had been in the popular press around that time. <laughs> and I found this highly reassuring headline, out of control AI will not kill us, believes Microsoft research chief. <laughs> um, and then uh, his uh, sort of ar arguably distant boss saying, <laughs> I don't understand why some people aren't concerned. <laughs> um, and you know, my labs worked with the Gates Foundation for a few years actually applying um, some of the AI technology we build to some of their public health problems. I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, but I think it's actually striking that you see leadership of many organizations that are heavily involved in AI research also in this kind of uncomfortable state, not knowing you know, what's hype, what's real opportunity, what's risk. Um, and I see that in the investing community as well. I, you know, I, my lab's at MIT, but I do a little bit of tech entrepreneurship as well. And this, this sort of mix is, 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 seems pretty widespread. Um, and you see books uh, talking about legitimate changes to the workforce um, that are l l l and 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 uh, and uh, re really challenging, very old uh, economic assumptions, um, all the way through to books um, that that could not paint a grimmer picture. Okay. So um, to step back from that fear, I think one one way. Um, uh, 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 to get some perspective is to is, is again to go back to Watson. Um, so so that so, so so I'm showing Watson along with Dave Ferrucci, Watson's the uh, uh, principal designer. Um, and Watson is indeed better than Dave at Jeopardy. Um, but Watson uh, can only play Jeopardy. And Watson consumes about 80 kilowatts of power and has processing elements that are clocked at around 3 gigahertz. Right? So that means you know, they make a very large number of transitions every, every second inside the chips inside, inside Watson. Whereas Dave's brain uh, makes state transitions much, much more slowly. And he can uh, function all day on a cheeseburger. Um, so, 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 so human intelligence is both far more flexible and creative than machine intelligence thus far, and also staggeringly more efficient. This narrowing this gap is one of the main research themes uh, in, in my lab. Um, and, you know, I think depending on how you count, there may be six or seven orders of magnitude in terms of power, performance. Uh, 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 if you take the product of measures of powers and power and performance, there may be six to seven orders of magnitude of gap by some measures between uh, neural computation and uh, the chips that Intel makes. And, you know, our most successful proposals we think might narrow that by two or three, <laughs> maybe. Um, and those are still quite radical. Okay, despite that, um, I, I, there have been real changes. So one way to look at these changes is, is first, we, we, we'll, let's start with what hasn't changed. So the basic conceptual vocabulary around data hasn't really changed over the last few decades. Right, so the modern data environment was enabled by 
the relational database. And the basic usage patterns around it have been constant for decades. However, um, the fact that that picture on the right is on an iPad and in color actually matters. Right? So it's much easier to get access to the information uh, that you can describe conceptually with a simple SQL query today than it was a few decades ago. And that does have the potential to be transformative. And that creates new risks. So that's like a, that is absolutely a legitimate change. Not really an AI change per se. I'd argue the AI shift was from the pre-database era to the, to the database era. The cost of storage has decreased by many, many orders of magnitude. Um, and uh, the cost of computation has decreased. So you, you, you can't see the numbers, but the y-axis um, you know, is measuring uh, dollars. It's plotted on a log scale. Um, the x-axis is years. And the dots correspond to specific computing machines. But they're showing how much did it cost to have computing power equal to an iPad 2. <laughs> right, so back in the days of ENIAC, <laughs> it was one trillion dollars. <laughs> okay, so there really have been quantitative changes that, ha that lead to some qualitative effects. And I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trying to help give you guys a little bit of detail for understanding this picture because I think, um, although there isn't a cocktail party summary of it, I think it's, it's an important part of the puzzle for understanding what the real risks and opportunities of AI are today. Okay, so it's not the case that we have more intelligent algorithms that learn somehow like the brain or like people do or like the mind. But it is the case that we have far more modern system software, depending on how you count, 100 to 10,000 X more data and compute for typical applications. And that this means that simple calculations work a lot better now. And that's especially true for calculations that are in service of statistical modeling. And that has given rise to some interesting AI advances. But it hasn't given rise to AI. <laughs> Right, so we've got component technologies that can do pattern recognition, you know, identify faces and everyday objects and images, um, help you find people you know, um, solve various sensory motor intelligence problems as you know you need to to do autonomous driving, you know, find documents. Um, but all of these are very narrow component technologies. So I just want to spend a minute, maybe just trying to remind us all about how far these capabilities are from intelligence. And as an AI researcher, I, I actually believe in the potential of AI to reveal something about our own intelligence and maybe someday to surpass it. I just want to point out how far we are. <laughs> so, Historically, there are maybe three main proposals for how to build intelligence out of simple kinds of calculation. Uh, one of them is to do statistics. These days you do statistics on a grand scale, but it's essentially, you know, very simple kinds of dimensionality reduction or regression. Uh, then there was logic, logical deduction. Uh, and actually both databases and hardware verification, the whole hardware verification industry, so designing computer chips, none of that would work without uh, the ability to do very uh, uh, sort of logic on a grand scale. And then there's heuristic search, which you could think of as like, you know, when AlphaGo or Deep Blue sort of explores this vast space of possible moves, it's partly guided by statistical models, but it's partly guided by technology for how to do search of very large spaces. These are three very, very old intellectual proposals for what intelligence might be that you know, existing computing machinery has helped us implement and, and scale up. But it, our intelligence is not just about pattern recognition or logic or search. So at minimum, it's also about modeling the world. 
So that includes explaining and understanding what we see, imagining things we could see but haven't seen yet, uh, being able to solve problems and plan using these models, and building new models as we learn more about the world. And in fact, um, mature intelligence also requires the ability to model the strength and limitations of our models. <laughs> Right, to sort of know something about when we know something and when we don't know something. So these are all aspects of intelligence that are, I might say, just at best barely present in state-of-the-art AI systems. Unfortunately, if you see the marketing language around AI products, um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, I think, uh, uh, disappointingly common to see claims made uh, to these kinds of capabilities. Um, but there, uh, if I put on my hat of somebody who sometimes does diligence uh, in the sector, I can say it's not true. <laughs> the software can't actually do that. If it could, I would tell you about it. <laughs> um, and if you'll permit me to be philosophical for a moment, um, so I'm, I'm, my, my lab's actually housed in a brain and cognitive sciences department. Um, uh, there's some really brilliant writing on what the nature of an explanation is that I think is actually relevant for us understanding what potential AI has to help improve medical care. Um, so uh, in a book from the 40s uh, uh, called The Nature of Explanation, um, I'll just read the sections in blue. Um, if an organism carries a small-scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it's able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events uh, in dealing with the present and the future, and in every way react in a much fuller, safer, and more competent manner. So, so that sounds nice <laughs> for um, many applications in medical care. If we could actually equip our software with enough intelligence and ground that intelligence in the available empirical data and do so in a way that we felt uh, was supportive of human values and some of the principles around privacy and empowerment we've seen discussed here. And I'm very interested in, in research that can help bring us closer to, to that. Um, Okay, so maybe uh, one or two last points about AI hype versus reality before we start talking about um, some some new or you know emerging AI technology that I think is relevant. Um, so I think th th there's often a, a discussion in, in AI and machine learning around the difference between black box modeling and interpretable modeling or at least a critique that's offered of machine learning or AI systems, that they are black box, that they produce outputs that n demand an explanation. I I'm sympathetic to this, but I think um, here it, m it may be helpful, especially in this community, to recognize that this problem is not new to AI, and there's a model for it in existing software. So, um, uh, computer chips can be specialized to particular problems. Like a physical chip that's, you know, an application-specific integrated circuit is maybe useful to think of as like the paradigm case of a black box. It's like you have it, you can put in problems, you can get out answers, and it takes an enormous amount of equipment to even see the physical structure that's performing the computation, and that won't tell you anything about the internal logic by which the answer is, is coming out. So it's actually far easier to reverse engineer than a mind or brain of a person solving the same problem, but it's still almost you know, impossibly opaque. But the way that chips are designed is you start with very high-level ideas that you translate into software, and you maybe run them on a processor, or you start making custom hardware for them. And as you move from that very high-level description down to a low-level description, you move from a version of the problem that's evolvable, inspectable, communicable between people, but slow, 
uh, to one that you can make machines that do very efficiently and in low power, but that's opaque. So there's this intrinsic trade-off between inspectability, evolvability, communicability on the one hand, and certain kinds of specialization or performance on the other. And you can actually see this in biological evolution, arguably, as well. Um, I'm not an expert on that, so I don't want to go into it too much, but happy to talk about it offline. Um, in any case, uh, we're also seeing that tension in AI. So th I, I say this because when we hear discussions of a right to an explanation or um, the desire for more interpretable output from our AI systems, my response, I mean, on the one, well, on the one hand, I'm sympathetic. <laughs> um, I also find myself sometimes feeling uh, um, like that, that request really ought to apply equally well to the opaque black boxes of human decision makers um, uh, or socio-technical systems or existing software that doesn't have the technical complexity of like a whole lot of regression weights or you know, some big neural network that is sort of obviously opaque. Uh, there are many other decision-making systems we depend on that are essentially opaque or that disempower us maybe just as deeply. Okay. Um, and this is an issue I'm very interested in, happy to talk about offline. Um, uh, that said, um, uh, I want to point out that there is a lab that I did not see represented here at Harvard. Um, so I have no collaborations with this lab. Um, uh, but I want to mention them because I think they're very relevant for your community. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the PI is Finale Doshi Velez. Uh, the lab is the Harvard uh, Data to Actionable Knowledge Lab. And Finale is one of the smartest young academics I've, I've met in general, but also doing incredibly creative work um, applying probabilistic AI techniques that, very, that, that strike different trade-offs between interpretability and performance to um, uh, very messy clinical problems. Um, and unlike many AI researchers, uh, she's actually learning the medicine. Um, and sort of the research is conducted from a posture of basic respect for domain knowledge in medicine as opposed to the premise that it could somehow be automated away. So I think it ought to be very relevant for, for this community. Okay, good. So I'm about half done, which is perfect. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some new technology uh, that I think, you know, may help us frame some of the problems uh, around applying AI to health data a little bit more sharply and create some new risks and possibilities. Okay, so my lab uh, uh, sort of really doesn't focus so much on artificial intelligence that is beating top performing people at their own game, but um, uh, augmented intelligence. So building AI systems that can collaborate closely with people. Um, and by people here, I mean, you know, for example, in, in, in my entrepreneurial hats, it might be business decision makers. Um, uh, but in my research hats, it's more like clinicians, uh, visual designers, and AI researchers. Um, and so the idea is you want to have, you you have AI systems that can work in conjunction with a human supervisor, act as a kind of intelligent assistant. And that means you don't just want to like put in features and get an answer out, uh, but you want to have the human be able to give guidelines, questions, and hints in some language that can describe their incomplete knowledge of, of, of the problem they're trying to solve. And the AI assistant needs to be able to hand back partial solutions in some cases with some notion of uncertainty. And if, if you have that, if you have languages f for that kind of communication, then the human machine team can solve problems that really neither kind of intelligence could on its own. So um, I, I think there's an enormous need for AI software that uh, works in, with people in this way. So m you know, my lab's done a little bit of work with, with the Gates Foundation, which um, uh, is a very interesting organization, f I, I think, for a number of reasons. But, but one of them is that they have such a broad range of data sources, partly because they fund primary data collection internationally, and a network of consultants and domain experts in many fields. But for very basic questions around which they're doing policy advocacy, um, there's a real lack of agreement on this fundamental science um, that ha creates huge roadblocks uh, for credible policy advocacy. So, for example, um, you know, let's say uh, this is this is a slightly modified example from 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 one that that came up, but but I think it'll help make the point. Um, 
there's some people who believe that a certain type of, of, uh, of vitamin A um, administered, uh, actually, how should I put it? So there's some studies that argue that um, you can save uh, lives um, by giving kids vitamin A in a certain form at the right time. But those only seem to work in some parts of the world and not others. That is, the studies so far seem to suggest that it works in some places but not others. And the people who ran these studies don't really, to the best of my knowledge, know why that is. Um, it turns out that the World Health Organization apparently is unwilling to um, make policy distinctions without a biological mechanism. So not willing to do it geographically. That's considered phenomenological and therefore just somehow not really public health or world health. Um, and you know, for some interventions, they could be costly or difficult. So now you have this interesting question, which is the Gates Foundation leadership is meeting with people who are empowered to maybe carry out an experiment or test an intervention in some area, and they need to argue that they should do it on the basis of a study that was done elsewhere. How do they argue that it's gonna be generalizable? Or worth the cost, right? So that's a type of problem that, that they have many, many versions of. Um, and the human expertise is too inconsistent to sort of necessarily lead to like persuasive arguments in all the cases where they think their data somehow or their knowledge ought to be able to, 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 to yield clear recommendations. So these are the kinds of, kinds of problems we've, we've been trying to help them with. Um, and there are real technical challenges that, 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 that these problems expose. So the first is um, there's, a, I think, an un, unappreciated replication crisis in data analysis. Um, so there's a, a really brilliant study um, which finally did a controlled experiment where they said, uh, let's give 29 teams the same data set in question. In this case, whether soccer referees are more likely to give red cards to dark skin tone players than light skin tone players. Um, and it turns out that the answers are across the spectrum. So, you know, 20 teams found a statistically significant positive effect, and nine teams observed a non-significant relationship. Just to be clear, right, these are all qualified analysts. The data set and the question's the same. But as anybody here who's done quantitative analysis knows, there are so many small judgment calls that go into formulating uh, the analysis plan and, and applying it. And that's maybe not surprising that you see a range of, of responses. All right, so credible inference requires good statistical judgment, and that's especially the case as you move away from very simple experimental designs into a regime where you have missing values and mixed types of data, and the data is quote-unquote uncleaned, and where you have inferential challenges, like you're studying a heterogeneous phenomenon, so maybe there's few real replicates, you know, uh, like in almost any kind of medical treatment, right? There's just so many uncontrolled covariates, you know, you have convenience samples, and maybe even just fundamentally limited causal knowledge, right? So these facts of reality of data and inference drive, I think, a lack of replicability in data analysis. And this, um, uh, in turn, can drive a lack of credibility. Um, so you know, when I'm when I'm teaching MIT students about data analysis, you know, I, I often start by reminding them that Churchill famously said, I only believe in statistics that I doctored myself. <laughs> um, and I, I find myself arguing it's not because Churchill was enumerate. You know, it's actually that I think many decision makers have learned to be mistrustful of data analysis that doesn't qualitatively confirm what they believe to be true. <laughs> because that lack of confirmation is evidence that the analysis may not be credible which of course makes it very difficult to study issues that are truly controversial. Um, and what you actually see, um, and I've seen this borne out absolutely, you know, when I've been in, been in my tech entrepreneurship hat, is that executives in more mature industries with respect to data analysis have a deeper distrust of data analysis. You see in life sciences and finance, it's actually like the deepest executive distrust of data analysis, which I think is great, actually. That to me feels healthy. Um, uh, but also I think helps to sort of highlight a problem, which is despite these vast data resources, there's still some fundamental disconnect um, 
And um, I, I don't believe that training more better statisticians is a viable solution. So here, you know, I may end up in an argument with colleagues of mine who are statisticians, not Andrew. Um, Andrew's great, um, you know, about this issue, um, and in general, actually. Uh, Andrew helped inspire the AI system I'm going to talk about later on. Um, but, you know, so he's, you know, uh, so, some of you uh, may, have, may, may have encountered him because he's, I think, maybe the only statistician on, a planet, on the planet to have a blog that's read by, like, many tens of thousands of people. It's like, I think it's about 30,000 readers or something. Um, it's a statistics blog. Um, uh, and he says, statistics is hard like basketball. We have to accept statistical incompetence uh, not as an aberration, but as the norm. And I think that's just the truth. Um, and uh, it's also the case, um, as I was talking about recently with, uh, with my dean of undergraduate education, that um, especially for problems which are about applying data analysis in the public interest, there's going to be an enormous gap of, of skills because data scientists just recently overtook various kinds of software engineer as the most demanded job on Glassdoor. And you see like the starting compensation here is like 110,000. These, this, these, these are for people out of undergrad. Um, uh, so of course, people who are trying to, you know, improve, let's say, you know, apply this stuff to data from the New England Innocence Project or the ACLU or, you know, any of these sort of, you know, that it, they can't get access to the same pool of, of candidates to do the work. Um, okay, so um, that sets the stage for BayesDB, which is this AI system, open source AI system my lab's been working on for about 10 years. Um, uh, it's one of our probabilistic programming platforms. And BayesDB tries to provide AI assistance for data science so that domain experts can ask and answer questions, maybe in seconds or minutes, um, uh, and get answers of a quality that compares with what they would have gotten if they had a consulting statistician, and for each question they gave that statistician, you know, a day or something like that to go do some statistical programming and, and whatever. So we want to build an AI system that can do in seconds or minutes what currently takes hours or days for someone with good statistical judgment and some statistical programming skills. Um, and uh, two of the companies I've been involved in, with have commercialized corners of BayesDB, um, really the corners that focus on descriptive and exploratory data analysis, so where you're trying to understand the data. A lot of our current research focuses on you know, moving through prediction to a little bit more causal and mechanistic understanding. Um, and it's all open source, and the papers are all online, and, you know, there's nothing proprietary about BayesDB. Um, uh, so what do I mean by data science? So this is something that may help this community in particular. Um, so uh, how many of you have seen Drew Conway's blog post that gives the data science Venn diagram? Okay, a couple of people. Great. Um, so... So I think um, this is a useful map, um, which says that data science lies at the intersection of programming, statistics, and domain knowledge. And if you don't actually have all three of those, you're doing something else. Um, so you could be doing machine learning. Um, many of my papers uh, are in machine learning conferences. Um, uh, and machine learning is great, but it works really when the data is cheap and the task is repeated and the errors are inconsequential. So, you know, predicting clicks, you know, or, you know, or likes, sort of like a great example of that. Um, it could be that if what you have is domain knowledge and statistics expertise, then um, you're doing traditional quantitative research which works great when you have simple data sets and tried and true experimental designs that don't expose the data or inference challenges I was mentioning earlier. Um, a big problem is that you need domain knowledge, <laughs> but if all you have is domain knowledge or domain knowledge and programming ability, you're in uh, one of these danger zones, you know, where it becomes very tempting to try to conclude things from data that, you, you know, may, be, um, may, not be, uh, may, may not bear out. Although I think I could just as well have colored some of the other circles red, right? They're just the dangers are different, right? Um, okay, so BayesDB provides AI assistance for data science. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Let me just give you this one s simple example. Um, on the right, there's like an architecture diagram for BayesDB, and on the left, there's like a little transcript with it, just on a little toy problem. So let's say you had a CSV file of information about customers. Well, you, 
So, so you can sort of talk to BayesDB in a conceptual vocabulary that tries to mirror what maybe an idealized statistician would be doing in their head. Right, so not what you currently tell a statistician, but what the statistician's somehow doing in their head. Right, so you might tell BayesDB, um, create a, a population which is like a representation of the conceptual population of interest, which goes beyond the data you've actually seen. Guess the statistical types and override the type for age. You know, treat it as a magnitude, can't be negative. Then create a thing called a meta model using some baseline crosscat thing, which, you know, in a longer talk I would spend some time on. Um, uh, but uh, make sure to use linear regression to predict income given age and state. Then initialize four models, which you can sort of think of as imagine four independent statisticians doing this analysis. Give them each a minute. Well, and there's some multiplier, right? So, you know, just like AlphaGo can play a thousand games of Go in a day, but it learns much less from each game than a human does. <laughs> you know, BayesDB can, you know, it learns a lot less from each encounter with the data than a human statistician does, but you know you can clone it on the cloud and it can play you know millions of of data analysis games if you like uh, um, at a time or you know in a day. And then uh, you can say simulate age and state given income, uh, and you get back a synthetic data table, which is generated data from an ensemble of models that reflects the consensus or lack thereof of these little virtual statisticians that, that did the analysis. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the basic concept for BayesDB. Um, a lot of technical challenges in making this work, um, and there's lots of papers. They're all online. You can read about them. Uh, actually, my student Faraz Saad has written a bunch of papers on this stuff recently um, that I'm very proud of him for. Um, uh, I just want to acknowledge the technical challenges because um, BayesDB has some capabilities that I think are a bit surprising. Um, and so, you know, that means that that one has to ask skeptically, like, you know, how, how, could, how could we do that? So the biggest technical challenge was how do you go from messy data to ensembles of baseline probabilistic models that are not total BS? Um, and that was something we spent about 10 years on. Um, uh, but there's also problems like how do you let users customize the modeling approach and put in more of their knowledge if they have it, which you've been working on over the last couple years, and then how do you define a language for asking questions that lets you expand on the types of questions you would normally ask a statistician in English, and you know, uh, but instead ask, ask this AI system. And you know, the, the vision for BayesDB at a place like the Gates Foundation is to create an AI-mediated conversation between policy advocates, domain experts, field researchers, statisticians, and the data itself, right? Where each of them can express parts of what they know and parts of what they're interested in knowing in these languages, um, uh, but rely on the AI um, to sort of try to mediate the conversation and ground it in the empirical data and reflect back the uncertainty that's associated with, with those inferences. Um, and, and we're not there yet, but I think, but, but I think we're making good, good progress. Um, and we actually just started analyzing data from the Mimic 3 uh, uh, project, which gives academics at a few institutions access to a particular electronic health record. Um, uh, so let me just show you one or two example queries, um, just so you see what results actually look like before we wrap up. Um, and I, I'll pose with some, I'll end with just some research questions I have for this group. So, um, so a lot of this work was funded by DARPA. Um, uh, so, um, one of the databases we applied BayesDB to was a database of satellites. Um, and here I'm showing one satellite, which, uh, because it was funded by DARPA, happens to be a Chinese defense satellite. Um, uh, and, you know, we've got variables like what country is it from, you know, what's its purpose, what's its launch mass or dry mass, what are the kinematic properties of the satellite's orbit. You know, so various variables. And this is a visual representation of the data. And by the way, the red indicates, so the rows are satellites and the columns are variables and the color indicates the value. But red means missing, right? So this is an actual database you can tell because a lot of the values are red, right? Um, uh, so one question you can ask BayesDB is imagine I had a satellite in geosynchronous orbit with a dry mass of 500 kilograms. Who's probably operating it and why? Right, so simulate 600,000 synthetic satellites and tell me their country of operator and purpose given this constraint. 
Um, and then you can watch the results stream in to kind of get a sense of the uncertainty in the answer. Um, uh, and so, you know, it turns out that, you know, actually this means I don't know, <laughs> right? You know, m US communications is the most likely, but that's less than 25% likely. Um, uh, Another thing you can ask BaseDB to do is ask it which data entries are probably bogus. <laughs> or at least what are ones that are surprising given other variables in the database. Right, so sort of the one experiment I'm curious about for this community would be what if you could get statisticians or domain experts to look at every field in every EHR you've ever looked at? And like rank on a scale of one to 100, how likely to be bogus each field is on the basis of the four variables that are most relevant for predicting it, or the 400 variable. I don't know, right? You know, do all of the above. What fraction of data in your EHRs would survive that screening? I don't know, but that to me is a very interesting data integrity project that you could actually do with an AI, um, because it's practical to get the AI to make all those judgment calls. Um, so it turns out here we detect a whole bunch of errors that I, I won't go into, but we've been reporting them to the public database maintainers um, for the satellites database. You can also ask BaseDB to help tell you which variables probably predict one another. So here we took a look at the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare. Um, uh, and again, I've only, I'm only beginning to, under, to, to look at applications in health, so pardon me if I say something very, very, very naive about it, but um, you know, this, the version of the database we looked at had like 70 operating metrics about hospitals, like measures of cost and capacity, you know, and surveys, like congestive heart failure quality score, and you know, you know total number of, of Medicare dollars spent per decedent, and you know, things like this, right? Um, and one of the things you find if you ask BaseDB to just make a map of which variables probably predict one another and which don't. Right, so that's what we did, we did up there, is you find these four variables are the quality scores, which BaseDB is pretty sure are independent of all the other variables. <laughs> um, which I remember thinking at first, was like, this has gotta be a bug, right? But then we started to do some research and we said, oh no, actually, this is what was argued by, a tol uh, by um, I think it was Gawande and the New Yorker, and you know, this was sort of one of the findings that led to some of the design choices in the, affor in the Affordable Care Act. Right, so I'm very interested in working with people who actually know something about hospitals and healthcare. <laughs> um, because to me, I can't tell if this is a bug or not, right, without doing a lot of research. Uh, but probably people in this room, you know, you know, would know how to ask more interesting questions. Um, and you can find hospitals that are very unlikely, right? So you can say which hospitals are deviating from what you would predict based on the characteristics that are measured in the database. So one fun thing you find is that uh, uh, McAllen, Texas has far fewer doctor's visits per decedent than you'd predict based on its other characteristics, and McAllen actually is the hospital that they talk about as the anecdote that carries the narrative in Gawande's article, because they do too many tests and all this other stuff and not enough patient time. Um, uh, okay, so, right, so just to summarize. So, what this is, what I'm really trying to say from an AI risks and possibilities perspective, is that right now, whatever you think the risks and possibilities are, I think they're both a lot greater. <laughs> because existing machine learning technology is kind of like data storage was before the database. So just so we remember what that was like, there was a, I think, distressing article in, in, in GQ last summer which points out that if a police department searches for a gun, that request goes to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms where it is serviced by people scanning microfilm. And that is because of uh, 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 laws that were passed, I think, in the 60s that prevent there from being a computerized database of guns uh, in the US. So uh, the chief in charge of this bureau has reinvented database performance optimization as carried out by probabilistic computing units, namely his staff, <laughs> to try to optimize this, the latency and reliability of this bureau. Okay. But we can all recognize this is at least technologically ridiculous. <laughs> and that's because we're used to the idea that there's this so AI software called a database, which you can like easily configure using logic to answer these sorts of questions. So my view is that whatever we think the risks and possibilities of you know, uh, statistical analysis at scale, that branch of AI are in healthcare, they're far greater. <laughs> because those risks are being identified as if people were doing the searches on microfilm 
And efforts like ours, you know, are trying to actually create the AI system, which which makes this mode of 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 of, of work um, uh, uh, um, too inefficient. And maybe there'll be some new capabilities created. So I just want to close by 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 listing three kind of projects that have been on my mind since since um, I mean some of them for a while, um, but but that I think I would love to talk more about with people here. So the first is, um, so with BaseDB, you can take a, a database and easily make a synthetic database, but that hides variables that BaseDB thinks are probably informative about some sensitive variables. All right, so you can take a database and generate a proxy database that actually tries to hide information that BaseDB could, f you know, based on which variables BaseDB thinks might tell you something about a sensitive, sensitive variable or a set of sensitive variables. So we haven't tested this adversarially yet, um, but I think this is, this is relevant maybe for compliance with the GPDR. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I barely know what the GPDR is, but you know, um, that's a possibility. Next one would be, um, I'm very interested in understanding how tech, what's technologically required to give people more control over their own data, but also the narratives around it. And so that requires giving them control over the variables that are used to code the data, not just somehow the, the data itself. And uh, I can't go into it now because I'm a little bit over time already, but, but I think there are ways to integrate BaseDB with the blockchain um, to build a decentralized data sharing protocol um, and then still have the ability to, to use probabilistic search on top of it to like reconcile different viewpoints that disagree about what the relevant variables are. So for people who kind of you know, find that stuff interesting, I'd love to talk more. Uh, um, there are several uh, connections between that and, and, a, and a whole bunch of public interest projects. And then the third is, my lab's in the early stages of helping people start to build multivariate maps of poverty and equality and some kinds of psychological suffering, at least as evidenced by um, adverse events to psychotropic drugs and opiate addiction and things like that, especially in you know, rural sections of the country. Um, we're using this as a test case for the geographical layer in BaseDB. Um, and I'm very interested uh, in um, integrating more data sources, understanding how to think about this, and really how to make the resulting data products useful to help uh, people in disempowered communities empower themselves uh, through, through advocacy that, that, that has an empirical basis. So uh, looking forward to talking about that uh, with anybody who's interested. Thank you. Rakesh, I, I don't think we have time for uh, questions. Uh, let me, what, do we? Okay, please. So I haven't stayed up to date with work that's going on at MIT, but what would help me sort of baseline an understanding of what you just said is how does Peter Senge's work integrate with the conversation you just had? Sorry, Senge or Solovich? Senge. Okay, I am not familiar with Peter Senge's work, so we should talk about the cell phone, at least yeah. not by name. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, very interesting. Let me think about that for a minute. Um, but we should talk about that offline. So I got a relevant question. Great. Uh, Deep Mind signed up with NHS. Uh -huh. I'm sure you're familiar with that, right? Uh -huh. And then, holy GDPR, they didn't get any patient consent for any of the records that they were doing. Where's the disconnect there? I'm. Um, not sure that's a question for me. Okay. Second thing, Ingmar Bergman had a great chess playing program in the Seventh Seal. And there's a very famous scene in there where he's playing chess with death. Is yes. that what you're proposing here with healthcare? <laughs> One thing I will say is that I think it would be very interesting if we could apply this to, oh. I think it would be very interesting if we could apply this kind of technology to help highlight 
um, in the U.S., uh, some of the systemic dis dysfunction around care for people who are in the process of dying and make a better case for palliative care. Thank you. No, Adrian doesn't have a question, really. Uh, Adrian, it's, uh, uh, I, I, uh, Deb asked me to thank uh, Vikesh for this uh, am amazing talk. And I, I want to try and uh, summarize uh, what an amazing day we've had today to start with Nicholas's, uh, uh, you know, discussion of consent. And, and, and how fraught that is as a concept in, in, the, in the world that, that we're living in in healthcare today. And then to close, and maybe you want to get into this, with how uh, much Vikesh's talk is starting to teach us about the real meaning of transparency, which has in healthcare, uh, whether it's policy making or decision support or anything in between. Um, and I, I just, I, I think uh, Deb and Amber did an amazing job of putting today's program together to put these two bookends on what we've done. Thank you, Vikish. Thank you. Vikish.